So to begin this experiment, we're going to look at four different simulations. So as usual, come over here, open up the 1100 folder, go into lab four, and then we'll find four simulations here. So we're going to look at all four of these. So I open up simulation one, and what it is is this is a ball on a string, and when I press run, it's going to start moving in a circle. It tells you what the x and y components of the velocity are, and also the magnitude of the velocity itself. So I click run, and just let this guy go. And first of all, they ask you some questions. So what is happening to the x and y components of the velocity? What's happening to the magnitude of the velocity? And then the most important question is the last one. Why is it that this object is accelerating? Because we can see that, uh, I'll just pause it for a moment, we can see that the speed here does not change. That's constant. It stays constant at two meters per second, no matter where we are on the spin. So why is it that this object is said to be accelerating? Hint, hint, I said speed, not velocity. So think about that question. Once you're done looking at this, you can close it down. Don't save this changes. Go on to simulation two, open that up. And what this one is, is I'm going to press run. It tells you what the velocity is, or rather what the speed is. As soon as I press run, it's going to also draw in the acceleration vector. So I press run, and there we go. And they ask you some questions about this as well. What's the direction of the velocity vector? Indicate on the diagram that's in your manual, and describe in a few words. In other words, um, the picture in your manual is a snapshot of this at one moment of time draw in the direction that the velocity and the acceleration vectors are pointing at that moment. So you draw them in, and then you also describe in words how they are oriented relative to the circle. Once you're done with that, uh, you move on to question three, which is actually not to do with the simulation. So I'll uh, show you that one in the next segment of the video. Question three is asking you to do a vector subtraction, but it specifically wants you to do a graphical vector subtraction. Not everybody's instructor actually shows them how to do this in class, so I'm just going to show you here so that you can do question three. So this is the diagram that you've got in your book, and it's basically showing an object at two different times and the velocity vector at those two different times. So when the object was here, the velocity vector pointed like so. When the object was over here, the velocity vector pointed like so. So it changed its direction over time. So to do a graphical subtraction, what you'd need to do is, you'll have to do this by hand with a ruler and maybe a protractor if you've got one, is you take this first vector and draw it over here so that it's touching tip to tip with this other one. So I can do that very easily with the computer. I just take a clone and move it over here so it's tip to tip. Now, because this is actually supposed to be a vector subtraction, if you were doing this correctly, you would swap the direction of the arrow. So this second one would actually point back this way. I haven't done that just because it's a little confusing, but in general what you're doing is you're going to take this first arrow and with your ruler, very carefully draw it over here same angle, same length as the original, but touching tip to tip with this other vector. And once you've got that, then the subtraction, one minus the other of those vectors, would be the vector that connects the two. So this red one here. And if you do it carefully, it should point towards the center, which is what we expect in uniform circular uh, acceleration, is that the acceleration vector should point towards the middle. So, like I said, you take this first vector and you redraw it over here, tip to tip with the, the second vector, and make sure that it is the same length and the same angle, and then the vector connecting the two should be your acceleration direction, which, if you've done it right, should go towards the center. Okay, now we're ready to look at simulation three and four, which are very similar. So opening up simulation three, what we have is two balls on strings, and they're going to spin when I hit run, and one of them has a speed of two meters per second, and the other has a speed of four meters per second. So the radius of rotation is the same for these two guys, but one of them has twice the speed that the other one does. So I click run, and it immediately draws in the acceleration vector. It's a small value here and a big one here. 
So what they ask you to do is to look at those magnitudes for the acceleration. We doubled the speed, but we kept the radius the same. And look for obvious proportionalities. What happened to the acceleration? Is it twice as big? Is it half as big? Is it four times as big? Look at the actual values and decide what's true. And then they say, OK, does the acceleration vary directly or indirectly with speed? Um, I will just warn you that as worded, that's a bit of a trick question. So think carefully. Um, you can figure out what the, the trick is. Uh, and then the last one they ask you is suggest an equation, a proportionality statement relating acceleration to speed. So what that means is you'd go A for acceleration is approximately, appro is approximately equal to, and then you'd have some function of speed there. And it's up to you to figure out what form that function of speed should take. So it'll be A approximately equal to some function of speed. Once you've figured that out, you can then look at simulation 4. So like I said, this is very similar. What's happening here is the speed here is 2 meters per second. The speed here is 2 meters per second. But they've halved the radius. So this is 1 radius, and this is 1 half radius. So again, we run this. And as soon as we start running it, it draws in the acceleration vectors for us. And you should look at the magnitude of those. And again, look for rough proportionalities. Is it twice as big? Is it half as big? Is it three times as big? What happened to it? And then again, does acceleration vary directly or inversely with the radius? And suggest a proportionality equation. So again, it would be A, acceleration, roughly equal to, and then you'd have some function of the radius. And you have to figure out what form that would take. And then question six says, suggest an equation relating acceleration to speed and radius. This will look suspiciously like something you've seen in class or even in the pre-lab, hint, hint. And uh, then you use algebra to check that the units actually work out and give you meters per second squared. Sorry, <laughs> meters per second squared. So this is the apparatus that we use. We've got a platform that spins, and mounted on the top of that is a sensor that is going to directly measure the acceleration felt by a little figurine that's been taped to the top of the sensor. We've also got a counterweight over here just to make sure everything spins evenly, and there is a photo gate here that has been mounted in such a way that when the sensor swings by, it blocks the photo gate, and then when it swings by a second time, it blocks it again. We're going to use this to help measure the period of rotation, which is the time for one complete spin. There are three things you're going to need to measure using this apparatus. The first two are used to get a theoretical value for the acceleration felt by the figurine, and the third one is a measured value from the sensor and using a computer program that I'm going to show you later. So the first two things you measure are the radius of rotation and the period of rotation. So radius of rotation is defined as being from the center of rotation, so the center of this little post you see in the middle, over to the location of the figurine. And so you just take a ruler and measure that directly. Now, what we're actually measuring with the sensor, of course, is not the acceleration felt by the figurine so much as the acceleration felt by the sensor itself. The technicians don't always put out these little figurines, so if your sensor doesn't happen to have one, look on the top of the sensor box. There's a little dot there with a Z beside it, and that marks the internal location of the sensor. So your radius of rotation should be from the center of this post over to that little dot with a Z beside it, or the figurine if you have one. The second thing that you're going to measure, as I said, is the period of rotation. And we've got this timer box. It's set in pulse mode, read, which just means the little red light should be on, and there's a reset button if you need to re-zero it. So in this pulse mode, what's going to happen is that when the box, when the sensor comes by and blocks the photo gate the first time, it turns on the timer. And when it comes by and turn, blocks it again, it turns off the timer. So we can just spin the platform, hit reset, and the timer will turn itself on and off automatically, and it'll time one complete spin. And that's what we want, our period of rotation. As I said, the third thing you're going to measure is the acceleration felt by the sensor, and you get that off of the computer screen in conjunction with the program I'm going to show you. There is one subtlety of the data taking you have to be aware of, however, and that is that when we spin this, it's actually slowing down gently due to friction. It mostly spins at a constant rate, 
but it is gently slowing down and you'll actually see that on screen so the program will show you your acceleration value and as the data comes across the screen you'll realize that it's a downward slope a very gentle one and that's just because as this platter slows down the acceleration being measured by the sensor is gradually getting weaker so you actually see that as the acceleration value on the screen is slowly over time getting less and less so that means we have to be careful about when we time our period and when we take our acceleration value. They have to be done at the same time or we won't get good agreement between our theoretical acceleration value and our measured acceleration value from the sensor. So the way in which you take the data is you would give your platter a bit of a spin, you reach over and start your program running, taking data, and you watch the data coming across the screen. Now that graph has vertical lines on it and you pick one of those and use it as a marker. And when your data reaches that marker line, that vertical line, you want to reach over and push your reset button quickly. And the reason why is then you can highlight just a small amount of data right after that marker line and get your acceleration value from that. And then that should be in good agreement with the calculated acceleration value you're going to get using this period value that you have. So before you take data, there's something that you have to do that's quite important is you've been given a little spirit level and you need to level the apparatus. So you put the spirit level here on the platform's base, so not on the spinning part but on the base of it, and you want to look straight down on the top of it, so put your head right over top of it, look straight down, make sure that the bubble is centered within the circle. If it's not, then the ends of these little legs can be twisted to raise and lower the different parts of the apparatus. So you can use those little legs to level things carefully. And you want to do that because if you don't, then when you look at your data coming across the screen, you will see a wavy line. So if things aren't leveled, you see that wavy line. A little bit of a wiggle is not a problem, but ideally, if everything's leveled properly, you should see a completely straight line come across your screen. All right, so this is the program that you're going to use for the spinning platter to find the acceleration on a spinning object. And you go in here to the 1100 folder, and you, there's two circular acceleration programs. We specifically want the one that says CMBL. There's also a Data Studio version. We want this one, CMBL Circular Acceleration. So we open that up. And because there is a wireless sensor and we need to get it talking to the computer, we first need to set things up. So first of all, make sure that your sensor is turned on. So make sure it's lit up and turned on. And then you go up here to Experiment, Connect Interface, Wireless, and then Scan for Wireless Devices. You may need to do this a couple of different times because sometimes it doesn't always find yours. So you wait and make sure that you've got your sensor uh, selected. If there's a list of them, just be careful. Look at the, the name on the side of your sensor and make sure you've selected the one that's yours, not your neighbor's. You hit OK, and it'll give you a collect button up here. Before you do anything, though, you want to zero the sensor. So the way to do that is without the platter spinning at all, just click this zero and then say OK to all the defaults. So the important thing is that your sensor is not moving when you do this. So now we should be ready to take data. So what I do is I give the platter a nice spin. Faster is slightly better. And then I hit collect. And you should see data coming across the screen. Um, the data will look like a straight line if you've leveled your platter properly. If not, then you would see a wiggly line on here. So this is a nice straight line. The important thing I would do if I was taking data is when I'd spin it, when the data is coming across the screen, at a certain point I have to hit the reset button on my photo gate to make sure that the acceleration value I'm getting corresponds to the period that I measure with the photo gate. So say I hit the reset button when the data got to this point. So it's progressing across and I hit the reset button here and then it keeps going. If that were the case, then I would want to highlight just one second's worth of data right after that point. So I hit reset button right here and then I select one seconds of data right after that and then to get my mean acceleration my average I go analyze here at the top and then statistics and that gives me a box that contains the mean value and this would be my acceleration value and it's going to be measured in meters per second squared